Ladies and gentlemen, dear members and colleagues, on behalf of the Franco-German Office for the Energy Transition, I wish you a good morning. My name is Sven Rösner and I will present today's webinar. I hope that you and your families are well. Thank you very much for having registered and tuned in today for this session during which we shall take a look at what has happened in Europe since the beginning of the pandemic. A little more than a year ago, on April 22nd, 2020, we had a very interesting webinar with Bloomberg New Energy Finance on the impact of COVID-19 on the energy transition. I believe that many among us, this for many among us, this was a mind-boggling moment when we actually understood and realized what we were in for. Um, to what extent this crisis had laid its grip on us and also that it would not be over as soon as we all had hoped for and how this would impact the evolution of the energy transition. And now that we slowly seem to come to the end of this intense phase of the pandemic, we wanted to provide you with a quick check of what had been predicted 14 months ago compared to what we know today where the scenarios were correct, where things evolved differently, and what all this means for the energy transition in the mid and long term, not only in terms of power generation and grid integration, but also in terms of energy efficiency and fu the fuel switch from fossils to decarbonized energy for mobility and heat. And it is a great pleasure and privilege for us to have David Hostet, Head of EMEA Research at Bloomberg New Energy Finance here with us today to hear his analysis of the state we are in and the tendencies he identified for the coming years. Good morning to you, David. We are very much looking forward to hear what you have to say in a minute. But before I'll pass over to you, I have a few technical announcements to make. We are aware of the fact that this issue has many aspects and that you, our audience, might have quite a few questions for our speaker. You can submit them via the question function in the webinar cockpit. We will do our best to keep at least 20 minutes for a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, but that might not be enough to answer all of them. I'd like to apologize for this eventuality straight away. However, we shall brief David on all unanswered questions after the, the end of the webinar. Also, the slides of the presentation will soon be available on our website and you shall receive a notification mail once they are available for you to download. Also, a video recording of the session will also be soon up in the members section of our website. A big thank you to Bloomberg New Energy Finance for agreeing to this. If you should experience difficulties with the sound or the image, my advice for you would be to shut down the webinar plugin and to relaunch it by clicking the link in the notification mail you received this morning. One last thing before we start, at the end of the webinar, you will be asked to participate in a questionnaire which consists of just five questions. You can skip that, of course, but if you participate, you will help us to improve our format. And that's all from my side for now. Let's get started. David, please take over. Have a great webinar, everyone. Yes, good morning. Good morning from London. Um, and thank you for inviting us back. It's a pleasure to speak to you this morning. Um, my name is David Hostert. I'm head of EMEA Research at Bloomberg NEF. And as um, Sven said, a year ago, my colleague Dario presented our COVID-19 scenarios. Um, we spent a lot of time at the time um, last year to think about what these multiple waves could mean, how consumers may behave, and what the right policy response could be. And it's always painful to walk back on one's um, previous predictions and, and look at them in the, in the cold daylight, but we we're going to try and attempt some of that today. When we spoke to you last, um, I didn't expect I would still be doing this from my, my guest bedroom at home, but, but such is life. 
Um, and yes, hopefully we can resume in-person meetings um, soon, or at least a hybrid form, and that, that would be very interesting as well. What I wanted to do today is just to zoom out and look at the wider picture of the energy transition as it is today, not just in, in Europe, but also a bit globally. And, and that includes not just the power sector, but also transport, industry and buildings. Um, and we'll do a bit of, of a whirlwind tour of all these sectors. Um, I think it's fair to say that COVID-19 has not derailed the energy transition. It may have accelerated the, the transport decarbonization and led to some promising developments in the hard to abate sectors. And that feels like the, the narrative has overall has shifted a little bit, which is a first step towards action. And action is really what's needed because we are very, very short on time. Um, next slide, please. So, um, you know who we are. BNFS is a strategic research provider covering global commodity markets and the technologies that drive the transition to a low carbon economy. Um, I myself sit in London and I have about 250 colleagues um, globally um, and we would be drawing on uh, their research to, to pull this together. Next slide, please. And really our coverage kind of goes across all aspects of the energy transition. Um, assessing pathways for the power, the transport, the industry, buildings and agricultural sectors and, and how they adapt. And really what we're trying to do is to connect the dots between those sectors for a full picture of the energy transition from digitalization to disruptive technologies such as hydrogen, carbon um, capture and storage. Um, and then of course the, the power sector, which is really where we originally come from. Next slide, please. And to, to do that, we're, we're part of the wider um, Bloomberg universe. Um, Bloomberg is a financial service provider, and we come to you in a variety of form. Um, we also run our own events. Um, and hope, yeah, hopefully we can resume those in person because they usually a lot of fun. Next slide, please. So looking back at the, tra um, the transition, looking back at um, what happened, um, we have to start with power. So this graph shows you power demand as a fraction of a business as usual scenario. And the us um, that's our own demand forecast based on historic demand adjusted for seasonal and weather effects. Um, so the dip in the first wave against what we would have expected in a business as usual scenario is very clearly visible. What's interesting though as well is that the lessons were learned after the first wave and the subsequent waves are not that clearly identifiable. So there's still variation around the, what, what we think is the norm but you'll struggle to identify exactly where the second and you know a potential third and fourth wave uh, would have hit. What's also interesting is that industry has not stopped again and likely also won't with the emergence of new variants now. And really um, for the power sector, weather is still the, the most important determinant for power demand. And we saw that a lot um, with the extremes. So last year, um, outside Europe, there was the California fire season. Um, there was unseasonable heat in May last year. Uh, this year, again, May was extremely windy, extremely um, cold. Um, we have the Texas power freeze in February, and, and right now um, China is undergoing a scorching heat wave, which is driving a lot of power demand and even led to rolling power cuts. So, so weather is, is really has, again, become the most um, important determinant. And what the pandemic has really done is, is provide a window into the future for grids. Um, so, and there were some really interesting lessons learned for operators and some unconventional responses. Uh, we saw in the UK that um, Sizewell B, a, a large nuclear power station, was shut down. Um, to, uh, and instead, um, the, the, the operator asked smaller power stations to come on and, and provide backups so that there wasn't a single point of failure. And it's just become, yeah, it just showed how hard it is to manage small net loads, manage maintenance schedules. And, and getting maintenance right is really, really the key for a functioning grid. But if I look at our own power projections um, that we did at the time, um, I think we did see that the first wave would be the, the largest dip and uh, the subsequent waves would be less visible. But I think we would have expected a little bit more um, of, an, of an effect. And, and part of why, the reason why it didn't happen is that the economic stimulus that came through was so um, strong that a lot of industry that may have shut down didn't, didn't shut down. Next slide, please. This indicator here is also an indicator that we started, and we started a bunch of um, high frequency indicators right at the start of the pandemic to, because all the usual metrics that we used to track the energy transition suddenly were too slow, um, or we, you know, we, couldn't, we couldn't see between the quarters. I remember sitting uh, in May, we tried to do an economic forecast, and 
uh, sorry, in April, we tried to do an economic forecast and the Q1 data hadn't even been made available. So that, that seemed like an awful long time to wait for something. So we started tracking all these alternative indicators. Um, this one shows um, road traffic. And um, you can see that, and it shows really congestion in major cities, peak congestion and tw against 2019 levels. And you can see that congestion everywhere outside China dropped in April, May last year. Um, and then it slowly recovered in, in the US, it's about half. In Europe, which is the green line, you can see it's almost back to normal. And London is actually um, exceeding pre-pandemic levels. And I can personally confirm that. Um, whereas morning traffic in Berlin, Hamburg, Munich, Zurich, and Madrid is currently below pre-pandemic levels. But overall, there's a recovery. And you can also see how in the rest of Asia, which is the um, maroon line, um, the traffic congestion has um, dipped again. And that's a sign um, that shows you the lockdowns in Southeast Asia. It shows you the lockdown in Japan. It shows you Indian restrictions. Um, so it is still kind of very, very well underway. And what's interesting here is I think that since this initial experience, um, we, we, we've been on these diverging paths where um, the different regions experience different, level, different levels of restrictions. Next slide, please. We're also tracking flight departures and, and flight schedules um, four to five weeks ahead, and that's an indicator of oil demand for us. Um, and the most severe drops happened in daily flight departures um, right at the beginning, and, and the recovery here has also been uneven. Um, the, side on the, the chart on the right shows you the North American um, flights, which are almost back to normal, and then Europe is very much down. We've seen actually that in last week, um, there was a market rise, and that's been driven by um, Spain and Italy. And we think, well, based on sky, flight schedules in the next three weeks, um, we'll exceed 2020 peak um, for, the, for the holiday season as Europe up, opens up, um, as France reopens the tourists with vaccinations, so activity is likely to increase again. Um, yeah. Next slide, please. One of the standout features of, of last year was the carbon price. And when we spoke last, where the carbon price had dipped, um, and we said at the time it would um, hold, and if it wouldn't hold, then government action would be needed. Um, and we did say that it needed to rise, um, and that's based on long-term tightness, or expected long-term tightness. Uh, instead, the carbon market went on a real bull run, and um, I'm going to speak to that later a bit more, but um, in short, it's uh, due to European Union accelerated targets. Um, the, the ambition on the European Union side uh, surprised the market, um, and the really high interest from financial investors who see this as a hedge against inflation, um, and also the beginning and expected beginning of phase four of the trading. The, so the red line is the carbon price, and you can see how that kind of increased markedly. And then the, the blue shaded area is what's called um, the fuel switching range. Um, so there's a lot of calculation going on here. But in short, when the red line is above or in the higher range of the blue band, then gas plants start to have a competitive advantage over coal. And you'll see gas plants switching off and um, coal plants, uh, sorry, coal plants switching off and gas plants switching on. And there's been record amounts of fuel switching uh, last year. Um, to the point that in Germany, the potential for more fuel switching was exhausted. Um, so that's due to lower demand um, overall, and then um, high renewable production that squeezes the opportunity for fossil fuels, um, what we call the thermal gap. And within that gap, an extremely loose gas market and high carbon prices shut down coal and turned on gas. And yeah, since then, the gas market has tightened again, and you can see that as the blue range is rising, and that has boosted um, has undone some of this uh, fuel switching and had, has boosted lignite in particular. Next slide, please. And the the boost to lignite really had um, a well, frankly, terrible effect on emissions. Um, so last year, um, this graph shows you um, power em, power sector emissions in select markets: so Germany, Italy, um, Great Britain, and France. And on the right, you can see the annual summary. And you can see on the right the the dip in 2020. Um, that was around 14% um, dip. And then this year, uh, we're expecting overall emissions to be higher again. Um, so they'll be 20% higher than last year and 4% and higher than 2019, according to our modeling. And that's despite demand for thermal generation being almost similar. Um, but because lignite is um, in the money and brown spreads are in the money compared to hard coal and gas, um, we see emissions rising again. And that really brings home um, you know, the challenge that the, the, the energy transition isn't over. And just because 2020 was this exceptional year, uh, we haven't so 
you know, fundamentally solve some things, although we are on a good way. Next slide, please. What's also been heartening is um, that the that renewable energy broke new global records. And if I look back at our predictions from the beginning of the year, from the first quarter, we do quarterly predictions every quarter, we look forward. Um, the the predictions in the um, Q1 were much more accurate or to the compared to the end results, compared to the, um, the scenarios we did in Q2. And we I think we oversteered on that. Um, so in 2020, globally, um, 216 gigawatt were added. And for context, up until 2010, there was only about 200 gigawatts of wind and solar in the whole world. So fast forward 10 years, and we're adding all of that amount every single year. Um, some countries are reaching very high penetrations. And in fact, Portugal is a leader and reached 30% of wind and solar in the first quarter. And the total renewable energy um, in that country was 80%, if you include hydro and biomass. So we're actually moving much much closer to this. Um, we, so the, um, for 2021, um, we're expecting actually a new, an, another record. And that speaks to another um, fact that the financing also hasn't stopped. Um, so we didn't see a dip in financing. There were some delays in build schedules. There were some delays in project delivery, um, but overall financing hasn't stopped. And, and that shows um, the maturity and the resilience of these sectors. Um, yeah, so we yeah we oversteered a little bit, um, but the Q1 predictions were right, and and that kind of tells us that that, that side of the transition really has been not affected. Next slide, please. Another standout performer last year were electric vehicles, and this is also an area where we oversteered with our um, pandemic scenarios. Um, again, the 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 Q1 numbers that we did. Um, were probably more accurate, well, they were more accurate than um, the scenarios we, we put out later. And EVs in a year when car sales actually declined, overall car sales declined, EV sales jumped by 50%, from 2 million to 3 million um, globally. And that means um, that's, yeah, it's 40% 40, 40, 40 more than 2019. Um, sales in Europe accounted for 44% of overall market. Um, and that shows you that, that Europe has really pulled ahead of China this year. Um, the chart on the right shows you EV share, EV sales as a share of new passenger vehicle sales, and the green line is, is Europe. So starting in Q1, Q2, um, consumer confidence or consumer interest in, in buying electric vehicles just really, really shot up. And that has very interesting, um, um, very interesting ramification for battery supply chains, for overall targets, and for Europe's role as a leader within the space. Next slide, please. The, the change has been radical. Um, for 2020, this chart shows you the um, EV share of passenger vehicle sales by market. So in Germany, it's been 14% of new sales. <clears throat> in France, it's been 11, UK 10. Overall, um, there were um, 12 countries where EV sales in Europe exceeded 10%. And EV adoption has generally been slower in southern and eastern Europe, and there's a strong western and, and especially northern Europe bias. Um, yeah, but the change has been really radical, and Germany has been by far the largest EV market in Europe, with absolute EV sales being two times higher than in the next two largest markets, which is France and the UK. Next slide, please. What's also not been derailed is investment and that, that became clear very early on. Uh, we also track investment on a quarterly basis and we could see there was no no visible dip really. Instead, um, 2020 has been a, a um, record year and by our best measure today, there's about 500 billion or a half a trillion of capital each year going into zero carbon assets and products. And the true figure is going to be higher because there are some areas like energy efficiency where we don't have good data. But call it, call it half a trillion and growing quickly. And one market that we also underestimated was small-scale solar. So we, we expected that um, an economic downturn would um, affect homeowners' um, ability to you know, splash the cash on, on solar systems, on solar plus storage system. Instead, wage subsidies and stimulus underpinned household income. And there were some record pockets of, of growth, um, particularly in Australia and in Thailand. 
Next slide, please. What's been, what, well, what didn't happen is um, building back better. And that really hasn't happened on a, on a global level. We started tracking stimulus um, for um, for green, like all the um, resilience and recovery stimulus, um, um, co kind of COVID-related announcements, and for all the rhetoric, um, build back better has not happened. So green stimulus was dwarfed by non-green stimulus, especially for aviation. Um, there's been lots of mutual spend on wage subsidies and disaster relief. And the, we thought there would be more of a distinction between short-term and long-term measures. Lots of money is not going to tech that is relevant for a green transition, but money that was previously not on the table is now available, especially credit. And, and EV and hydrogen were the big winners here, and I'm going to speak to that in a second. Um, but yeah, outside Europe, the Build Back Better rhetoric hasn't really gripped. Next slide, please. And there were only a few countries that made big claims, um, led by um, Germany, France, South Korea, and Japan. And the European Union has surprised on its inhibition. If, we, if you break down the, the stimulus that went to green, had green strings attached, um, there's 950 billion in, in national and subnational green stimulus approved to date. And that's, that's data is for March this year. And there was no kind of second wave after the first wave of announcements. Next slide, please. Instead, a, a bunch of money went into stimulus for carbon intensive companies and sectors that are specifically without green conditions. Um, and there's a wild mix of countries that, that this applies to on the right, but on the left, you can see that transport, um, outside aviation, so trains, um, all that, aviation, um, industry all received um, a good chunk of money um, that came without green conditions or explicitly supported um, fossil fuel industry. Next slide, please. So, have the measures worked? Um, what I wanted to do, next slide, please, is a to walk you through a bunch of, um, kind of key measures that I found across the different sectors, and then, uh, yeah, very happy to take questions to those in the end. Um, but these are my thoughts on on how the policy measures and the reaction has accelerated or you know, decelerated or at least had a neutral effect on um, the energy transition. So the first observation is that ambitions are rising. Next slide, please. In, in January 2020, a third of global greenhouse gas emissions were covered by a form of a net zero target. And today that's risen to two thirds. Um, there are several firm commitments, including roadmaps. Um, sometimes it's hard to untangle what was COVID, what was existing momentum, what was peer pressure. Um, but there's a, this market increase in, in net zero targets announced. Targets are really only effective if they're ambitious enough to realize effective change and realistic enough so not as to be meaningless. So that is a very tight rope to walk. And particularly on net zero targets, we're just beginning to grasp the true magnitude of that challenge. So keeping in mind that good policy takes a long time to be devised, to be implemented, to put money into action, um, still there's a strong signal here that ambition is rising. Next slide, please. To, to measure that ambition, and I, um, we devised a, a policy score methodology. Um, so these scores evaluate which governments have implemented the support needed to realize the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, that's a report, by the way, that's fully online. And I'll, I'll leave a link to that. Um, but together, these the G20 countries, um, 19 countries, including plus EU, account for about 70% of um, greenhouse gas emissions. And we scored them based on 122 um, metrics um, across uh, presence, quality, effectiveness. The Generally speaking, um, the, the bottom quartile are countries with room for improvement. Um, it's either lack of measures or... Um, Kind of wrong ambitions or wrong realism, um, and they often done little outside the power sector. The the third quartile from the bottom, and that's countries with relatively robust renewable energy mechanisms, but high policy uncertainty and often little policy outside power. In the second quartile, you have um, countries with strong decarbonisation policies and at least one sector, but incomplete an incomplete balance, um, and often they would lead in a very specific area. The UK, the US, for example ranks first in fossil fuel phase-out policies, um, or China is leading on EVs, um, 
but often they also have weak policies on buildings and industry. And as this forum, be happy to hear, Germany and France are ranking um, first and second respectively, and that's really based on high quality targets, transparent and predictable policy, and a measurable impact on renewable energy and EVs. And um, yeah, all five also have all five of the European nations also have net zero targets and price greenhouse gas emissions either through trade or through tax. Um, yeah, of the so yeah, as I said, of the G20 members, um, Germany and France have already legislated their net zero targets, and the target for the whole EU should also be finalized this year, um, and that will translate back into the overall EU um, rating. Um, yeah, but there is there is a kind of there's different speeds still within Europe. Um, Germany and France have gone further in the national level commitments um, than than others. Um, but it's an interesting scoreboard, and we'll keep updating this and reporting on it. Next slide, please. Another interesting measure for ambitions have been the um, EU recovery and resilience funds. Um, we've written a series of um, research notes about these and um, the and analyzed um, how the countries spend and tend to spend the 800 billion seamless package under the recovery and resilience facility. Um, the funds, if you look at how they're going to be spent, mostly back measures like public transport networks improvements and energy efficiency retrofits in buildings. Um, so those are all capital intensive spendings that boost local jobs quickly if, if they're designed well, and they will also boost power demand. What's been great about this mechanism is that it has forced countries to quote unquote do their homework and add details to mechanisms. Um, if we look at France and Germany in kind of very broad strokes, um, on the transport side, Germany prioritizes road transport, while France takes a more wider approach to reduce all transport emissions. And um, both countries keep their existing EV subsidies and, and, and measures. But it's interesting that purchase separacy are actually back on the table. And that's because previously the focus was shifting to the stick of emissions regulations versus the carrot of consumer capex subsidies, and that that's been a trend throughout um, Europe. If you look at the Spanish um, market, um, depending on how you calculate it, then capex subsidies volumes have increased eightfold under under these new measures. On the building side, there is a strong emphasis in France um, that contrasts with Germany's relatively low spending share, um, but both use spending to boost existing measures. And on hydrogen and industry. Um, it's been interesting to see details added to the hydrogen roadmaps that were published in 2020. And again, EU funding and, and, and debt um, has countries forced, forced countries to do their homework and add details to the schemes. Next slide, please. On the renewable side, the fundamentals remain strong um, despite COVID. And, and that's, that's really came through in the investment and, and build figures that I showed you earlier. Next slide, please. The witness order were not targeted in, in the recovery funds, and, and um, I'm going to say that's probably okay. Um, so the, in terms of cost reduction and in terms of uh, momentum that these sectors have, um, there's not been a need for more money per se, in, in our in our opinion. And and the the eight countries in question only allocated about five percent for renewables and grid. The the measures we've seen have been targeted and limited. So in, in Spain, it includes small scale solar plus storage um, to the tune of um, 1.9 to 3.7 gigawatt. Um, in Poland, that includes offshore wind. Um, Poland only announced their um, offshore wind plan following the announcement of EU funds. And then there's been um, power grid upgrades in Spain and in Poland and Greece and Portugal, um, which are about putting about two to 5% of the budget to that. So overall, we're not surprised to see a low share of the stimulus package going to green power and grids. Um, yeah, the, the mechanisms in place are broadly working. Next slide, please. However, what's holding back um, green green growth on, on the renewable side is, is not CAPEX, it's um, permitting and social acceptance. So the, the sum of all technology-specific targets set up by member states would increase renewable energy capacity by 77%. Um, so if you look at the, the chart and you see the 2019 column, that's what was installed in 2019. The middle column shows you what the current targets add up to. And the column on the right um, shows you what we think would be needed for a 2030 um, scenario to, to put the region on, on a track to net zero. 
in January we did uh, our own calculations, kind of what the 55% target would achieve. Um, we think it would require um, almost 600 gigawatt of net additions. Um, that includes a, a growing power sector. So if you if you then play that forward, um, what what that means for Europe is that based on our analysis, um, EU member states need to increase renewable deployment rates by almost three times um, compared to 2016 to 2020 levels. So in the next five years, we need to install three times what we installed, installed in the previous five years just to get on track. Um, that's triple triple the rate we're going, and it's a particular challenge in Germany and France. And the main hurdles really are permitting and um, social acceptance, the, me the mechanisms to get there exist. Um, auctions are undersubscribed, so it's not a, a problem of funding or technology cost per se. And, and um, yeah, really the, the recovery measures um, that, that come out of kind of the following COVID have not really addressed that problem. Although we know that many of you are very aware of that. Next slide, please. On Fossil fuels, the narrative has changed, um, and even though it's not necessarily an, or, or a one-way street, um, we think there's a, an interesting new momentum. Next slide, please. So as I showed you earlier, the, the carbon markets were the story of 2020, 2021, um, and this was the year the market roared back. Um, if This is because a very potted history of the carbon market. I won't go through it in detail, but if you notice in the middle, that's the valley of death. And um, with phase four and the uh, market stability reserve agreements in, um, in the EU in 2018, the market delivered some bite again. You can see the dip in COVID, but you can also see it's very temporary. And then the price recovered pretty quickly. Um, again, it's based on EU ambition. It's based on the start of phase four, which started at the beginning of this year. And then some bullish speculators driving the carbon price. And that's come with its own um, challenges, but it's also been um, a, a game changer for, for the fossil fuel market. Next slide, please. Now, the, um, the BNF Carbon team now forecasts a carbon price of over 100 euros by the end of 2020. That's our base case now, um, which is a pretty steep um, kind of markup compared to a year ago. And it's a pretty complex exercise to forecast current prices based on fundamentals and the underlying sectors and assumptions about policy. Um, but the, the interesting assumptions to watch that underpin some of this rise are three. Um, the first one is alignment with the Green Deal. Um, so the EU ETS needs to be aligned with the 55, new 55% target. And that proposal is due in about a month's time on, on July the 14th. And that'll be an interesting balancing act between the wider climate goals and the, you know, a just transition um, because the rapidly rising carbon price could mean the EU may take a softer approach and some elements of, um, of, of the reform, for example, by not rebasing the cap. The, the second one is the market stability reserve. Um, so by the end of this year, some of the parameters will be changed and that could be potentially contentious because um, changes to the market stability reserve are essentially can essentially reduce the cap through the back door which industry argue against. And then finally, there is a proposal for carbon border adjustment mechanisms that's due in the summer this year. Um, that's also highly contentious, both you know, with our trading partners outside Europe, but also within Europe uh, when it comes to free allocation for industry. So those are um, you know, still important reforms to watch out for this summer. Next slide, please. On, on coal, the the narrative has also accelerated so european coal plant closures reached record levels in 2020 and they're set to top that in 2021 um, you can see in 2020 we closed um, about 15 gigawatts of coal plants and this year it'll be more driven by unfavorable economics um, and utilities are closing unprofitable units and that's well ahead of national phase out plans next slide please so if you if you look at the at this chart here, I'm um, looking at um, coal closures versus economic um, that are scheduled versus economics driven. Um, there's a clear clear acceleration here, uh, where scheduled um, coal plant closures are um, yeah we, we we're basically ahead of scheduled closures this based on economics. Um, this could lead to power price increases because um, we need to replace some of that coal with more expensive gas, um, gas that will run on lower utilizations and that could push up cost. 
Um, and gas really currently appears as the only short-term alternative to back up, um, to provide the backup that coal has provided previously. Um, so that creates an, a, a tension that is not really mentioned because we, we're very happy that you know high intensity, high carbon intensity coal is coming off the grid in terms of the overall goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But at the same time, um, building gas plants now that will be on the grid for the next 20, 30 years locks us into unabated gas. And that also creates a stumbling block for net zero. Next slide, please. We, we did our own modeling of how what where we see the role of um, gas and looking at capacity factors, we expect that gas capacity factors will almost have from, from a peak in, in the early 2020s to um, the, the end of the decade. And this could lead, um, as I said, to power price increases because we also then need to find alternative mechanisms for these gas plants to make money in capacity markets. Capacity markets have been a big trend in the past months. Um, but um, when looking at their design, we, we need to make very careful that we don't lock into unabated gas and that we do look at, um, at, at, at like set, the, set the right borders and um, guidelines um, for emission caps and um, per, you know perhaps declining emission caps um, and making sure that you know some of these plants at least are hydrogen ready. Next slide please. And then finally just a very brief um, kind of flat outside Europe. Um, outside Europe, the G20 countries are still planning and building coal plants. Um, and you know, the, the coal phase out is a European story at the moment, um, even though um, Indonesia, since we published this chart, has um, walked back on some of its ambitions for coal. Next slide, please. On transport, um, the, the story is really one of rapid acceleration. Next slide, please. So Bloomberg and EF expects that battery EVs in all segments will hit upfront cost price parity with equivalent internal combustion engines vehicles within the next product cycle in 25, uh, 2025 to 2027. And what this chart shows you is kind of how the upfront cost of battery electric vehicles perform against internal combustion engines. And the crossover point, which is, you know, we're, we're all about crossover points at BNEF, the crossover points is in the mid 2020s. And that is a game changer for battery electric vehicles. Um, this is based on a bottom-up analysis that the team has done in May. Um, there, you know, there's still risks um, on re for this forecast that remain. You know, if battery prices don't um, fall quickly enough, or if demand is also a um, question of how to manage demand uncertainty. But we forecast EV sales will rise strongly in the short term and to meet the upcoming CO2 emissions target in Europe. And then these crossover points will drive the real growth beyond those strong mandates. Next slide, please. So this chart is part of our um, electric vehicle outlook, which came out last week. That's a one of our flagship publications. Um, this is the kind of the European picture. Um, I don't want to dwell on it too long because it's a very long report. Um, but just to kind of point out, um, you can see that um, overall passenger vehicle sales dipped in 2020. We think they will recover to 2019 levels um, by 2023, but then peak around 2033 and then gradually decline. And that's based on aging and shrinking populations in key markets, um, city policies, shared mobility, autonomous driving, um, and these things. Um, but what's also really worth noting is that internal combustion engine sales have already peaked in 2019. We're two years over the, kind of the peak in internal combustion engine sales, and we're expecting um, battery electric vehicles initially supported by plug-in hybrids, but increasingly battery electric vehicles to uh, really kind of represent the, the majority of the market, to rising to 80% in new vehicle sales um, by 2040. Next slide, please. So that means by 2025, we expect um, 4.3 million electric vehicles to be sold in Europe. That's about 30% of all sales that year. And, and battery as batteries come cheaper, they will become the more favorite tool to meet targets rather than plug-in hybrids. Um, but the chart on the right also shows that there's uneven growth here in, in Europe. So strong policy support and, and automaker strategies or market strategies favor EV adoptions in North and West Europe. And the growth far exceeds that of countries in the South or East. Next slide, please. The, the effect of that 
leading role that Europe is taking in um, EV markets in, in the short term and the midterm is that uh, the, the narrative for battery manufacturing has also changed. This chart shows you the um, cell manufacturing trends. Um, so where um, companies have made announcements where they want to build um, battery cells. And it shows that um, the market growth, so, so the overall over market growth for batteries um, quintuples, so it's by a factor of five, um, and the market share of Europe triples. And that's based on, on real announcements that we track today. So as batteries will dominate the, the vehicle market, electric vehicle market, um, they will also be, be key for the power sector, for the transport sector, and that makes a compelling rational argument for national interest. So rehoming those supply chains is something that in our view can work. Um, we think it's not too late to play catch up there and the investments made today make a difference even if they seem big now. So rehoming supply chains could be successful and this could be one of the um, success stories that comes out of that drive. Next slide please. And we'll, we'll talk about um, charging stages another day. Um, suffice to say, there's an, um, there's not, it's not exactly clear yet who will own this um, relationship. Um, utilities, oil, autos, independents all have a claim or a strategic rationale to build um, the charging business. And it's not clear yet how that will end up, um, but it's an interesting picture. Next slide, please. So fifth, um, the hydrogen pathway could have been unlocked on the industrial side. And this is interesting as the as we really focus on the hard to abate sectors now. Next slide, please. The We've started to look seriously into hydrogen about three years um, ago again. And I say again, because the, the startup New Energy Finance was founded in 2004 as an investment vehicle into fuel cells before it became a research house. So if we ever wonder why well, we have finance in the name, we were built um, or devised to finance hydrogen. Um, we believe this time could actually indeed be different and that money and programs for green and low carbon hydrogen could make a difference. Um, but producing hydrogen from renewable energy in an electrolyzer is currently expensive. So renewable hydrogen is currently um, at least two and a half times as expensive as the gold standard price of $1 per kilogram for hydrogen made from low cost fossil fuels. And that's the black line. Um, so the range is between two to $10 um, per kilogram um, but coming down quickly. And we, we believe that the potential, there's potential for cost to fall for two main reasons. Um, first is the cost of electrolyzers has already been falling rapidly. And we think the cost um, has the potential to fall um, more rapidly if electrolyzers manufacture, if electrolyzer manufacturing can scale up. And the second is really the cost of renewable power needed to produce green hydrogen, which is also falling. So by 2030, we see um, kind of the kind of the lower end of um, green hydrogen really just overlapping with the low cost hydrogen made from fossil fuels without CCS. Next slide, please. So we, we developed those cost assumptions based on um, two scale-up scenarios for electrolyzers at the beginning of 2020, so pre-pandemic, and we had two you know, two scale-up scenarios. One was the optimistic pathway um, for about uh, just under 30 gigawatt um, by 2030. And that has enabled us to come as, up with the cost of producing hydrogen with electrolyzers that are powered by renewables that you um, just saw earlier. But what if electrolyzer scale up happens sooner? And this is a particularly key question given many countries are now stacking up goals that would quickly bring us past our 27 gigawatt assumption. And the EU, for example, is aiming to get you know, 40 gigawatt of electrolyzer capacity by 2030 and the momentum to achieve this goal is rapidly emerging. Next slide, please. So this shows you the commitment of the eight member states that have already set their own electrolyzer targets, which would bring us nearly three quarters of the way to achieving the 40 gigawatt role. And the delivery of these targets would bring cost declines even faster to the production of renewable hydrogen. Next slide, please. There are, however, still missing pieces. In, in April this year, we organized a roundtable event with industry experts, and amongst others, we polled them and asked, what is the most important missing point for scaling low carbon um, hydrogen for a low, for a um, hydrogen economy? And the answer was very clear, it's demand side incentives. So of our roundtable participants, um, the kind of 15 out of 21 voted demand side um, Ultimately, you need a combination of all of these 
Um, but the the consensus was that existing hydrogen users are in industry are a good place to start, but ultimately they're not enough to scale. So we're very interested in looking for contracts for difference, for a change to industrial policy, carbon pricing, green product mandates, injections into the gas grid. Um, there's been a lot of focus on the supply side. We need to shift that to the demand side as well. Next slide, please. Uh, David, just one quick request. If we want to uh, keep a few minutes for a Q&A, maybe we can uh, speed up a little bit. Thank you very yeah, much. No, that's fine. Um, thanks, Tim. Um, next slide, please. Let's um, yeah, let's let's end let's end on buildings. Um, as I said earlier, the 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 majority of funding, a lot a lot of funding went into energy efficiency measures. It went into electric heating. Um, I talked a lot of a lot about this with my colleagues in the renewable heat team. Um, fundamentally, um, the challenge here is how to bring money into consumers' hands. Um, so the failure comes from not getting money into the right hands. And um, the focus of the existing, pro uh, the focus of this, um, the drive to um, put funds into programs has been focused on existing programs, um, and that you know is, is the best way to accelerate it. Um, but where schemes fail is where the administration is incomplete or failing, and that's been very very visible this year in the UK with the Green Homes Grant for heat pumps. It fails where there's um, not the relevant skills or where standards are lowered to allow the, the, the um, to kind of lower the bar for skills, and that leads to frauds. Um, so it's good to see a harmonization of standards in energy efficiency. Um, but overall, the um, yeah, that, those those are the main challenges um, for energy efficiency measures. Um, next slide, and then the one after. Yeah. And then, um, as with this presentation, we need to move much faster. Um, if we think about the, the challenge um, of decarbonization, then 2020 really needs to be the, the period of action. And um, the, it's good to say, the, see the targets that are coming through. Um, but overall, um, like just grasping of what a net zero challenge actually means, um, I think the past 18 months for me have shown that we're only just beginning to, to grasp the true magnitude of that. Um, and the 2020s have to be the period of radical actions and we need to move much faster. I'm going to stop it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. This is very exciting stuff. And um, as you said, maybe we need to 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 uh, to, to move much faster. But um, in the meantime, there's also so many things to uh, to consider so um i think there is a, a nice analogy between your presentation and um the the state we're in um uh, we received a few questions but please do not hesitate to send yours uh, via the question function of the webinar cockpit and um, um the first one um i would like to uh, to ask is um so you have been talking about um, uh, the 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 rise of the ETS uh, price, um, which will especially have an impact on on Germany. And now we have had this uh, Supreme Court uh, judgment where um, the Supreme Court said that Germany is not doing enough in the federal policy to to achieve um, uh, or to to uh, combat climate change um the um, the date of maybe anticipating the coal phase out um by 2030 has been uh, very present in the in the media uh, ever since um we saw that um your um analysis says that um the coal phase out might come uh, a lot earlier do you think that um the question is not regulatory in in germany but uh, more uh, with a with an ETS price of almost 100 euros, um, will the coal phase out come much earlier than 2035, which was the date uh, planned by the federal government? I I th I think that's a realistic option. Um, what's if we if we look at the kind of within coal um, again, looking at um, kind of coal um, coal to gas switching and 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 vice versa. Um, the lignite has a tendency to stick around much longer, and lignite is also the more polluting fuel, um, and it's also the fuel that you know where often you have 
um, in, in Poland, local mines, um, other kind of jobs um, attached to. So I think that that really it very quickly becomes a, a question of what is a, a just transition for those regions, for those um, um, kind of employment opportunities. But um, in terms of um, the, the pressure on coal, that is very real. Um, the, the challenge is um, we, we do need some of this backup capacity. Um, and uh, yeah, what, what will replace it? And, and that's, I think, a discussion that we'll, we'll hear more of in the future. Yeah, and you, as you mentioned there, um, it's unlikely that uh, this gap will be filled by renewables. Um, and no. also, I think there is another question we have been talking a lot about economics of, of energy, but um, in terms of physics, obviously, um, a lot of other questions will emerge if um, if there is an acceleration in the construction of uh, renewables, how the, the system will react. You mentioned uh, the construction of uh, gas plants, which uh, might become, as some say, um, uh, stranded assets uh, within um, a few years after their uh, connection to the grid. What is your take on that? Is there a viable perspective for uh, gas-fired plants um, until 2040, maybe? We, in, in our more in our own modeling, we see a, a perspective for gas plants well until 2050 or or need need at least, and that is because we we struggle to model technologies that aren't there yet um so th there's clearly a um a role that we need to fill in the system and you know label it technology x or or whatever but it, it will need to be able to react fast run on um kind of low uh, capacity factors and um and it needs to be kind of greener than unabated gas and that is a very hard hurdle to jump um, we talked about, um, we looked into some kind of how hydrogen could play that role, uh, whether hydrogen fired um, CCGTs um, could play that role. And whichever way you turn it, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty tricky problem, especially as we move into the 20s, 30s, 40s, really like getting to net zero. And the and again, coming to what I said about the net zero targets, um, we, we looked at the US targets and we think, based on our calculations, the U.S. power grid need to be completely carbon neutral by 2032 to reach net zero by 2050. Mm -hmm. And that just, you know, gives you the, the scale of the challenge. If you start making decisions on um, building gas plants in the late 2020s, you will just not get there. Um, yes. And um, one thing I find always a little bit depressing about presentations like this is that we see that it's very difficult to trigger more energy efficiency, whereas we talk a lot about additional uh, consumption of electricity. If we look at um, the rise of the electric vehicle, which will be, of course, um, a, a great way to decarbonize um, one vector of uh, CO2 emissions that has actually um, not um, had um, a positive evolution since um, since the 1990s. Uh, we also talk a lot about hydrogen now. So, um, do you think that um, there there is today enough um, reflection and also action um, to to trigger um, more energy efficiency, maybe in buildings and also in the industry? Yeah, we. I mean, energy efficiency has been hailed as this low hanging fruit, but it really isn't. It's it's very it's hard. It's hard. It's decentralized. Um, my colleagues um, did some analysis on, on, on how the French and German programs could trigger oh. um, efficiency drives, and, and the answer is it's it's not it's not enough. Um, as somebody who personally applied for um, kind of green home grants to have a heat pump installed, um, I can tell you it's 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 a nightmare to get to get through this. Um, and the yeah, so that there there is. It's, if, if you think that kind of buildings and buildings heat makes about 6% of overall global greenhouse gas emissions, um, it, is a, it is a huge sector to tackle. And um, coming back to this um, kind of trilemma between the right funds, the right administration, the right skills, all of these need to move in, in lockstep to, to get us somewhere. 
Yeah, so we see that is the, the individual household and our uh, next question also goes in that direction. Um, you were talking about um, acceptability of um, uh, as, as also as a key um, um, question in the energy transition, but um, there has been a lot of talk in Germany also recently about um, the uh, the impact of the energy price uh, and and carbon um, taxation uh, on the incomes of uh, households. Uh, do you think that ultimately um, there uh, there is a risk of the acceptability of um, decarbonization as a project for society if um, energy prices rise and on the other hand um, energy consumption does not decrease um, to uh, to counter um, this uh, increase of uh, energy pricing mm. yeah the i mean o overall distinguishing between the kind of short term and, and long term effects of, of decarbonization um, if you if you look at the, um, the kind of marginal cost of producing renewable energy, then long term you would expect that energy prices do fall. I think we'll see some short term effects on on rises, particularly now with the carbon price rising, with you know gas and coal at the margin. Um, but yeah, I think you're absolutely right. There are some questions about what is a a just transition, but also a realization that decarbonization does come at a cost. Um, there's not, um, yeah, let's that's, that's not pretend that um, this doesn't come at, at some cost um, to society. How that then gets allocated um, is, is a different matter. But it also produces a lot of opportunities, opportunities for jobs, opportunities for um, kind of growth. And yeah, I think you're absolutely right. The energy system will, we, we believe that electrification is a big vector for decarbonization. Um, so the energy system will need to grow to um, accommodate for EVs, to accommodate potentially for hydrogen, um, and to uh, accommodate for in industry as well, um, which will counteract some of the kind of depressing factors in energy demand. Overall, energy demand is falling in the developed world because of energy efficiency um, and, yeah, because of the, the way we use energy. Okay, one final question because we're already running out of time. Um, if we look at um, you, you, you say we are, we are moving towards an age of <clears throat> of um, um, electricity as the major source of energy. Um, some people talk about um, the the old uh, electric age, um, and we if we look at the technologies that are decarbonized today, they have in common that um, they are very low on marginal cost. So the question would be. Um, do we um, build the energy price drop or decrease um, in um, in the long term, uh, and also will the spot price or will marginal cost be the ideal way to finance energy tomorrow? Will it send the right signal for people who want to invest in in energy um, generation? Um, your, your your question is about um, market market design. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah, I think that there's you know, this is a debate we, we had over the past five years really. Um, that, that is it is it is fu fundamentally the energy market is a very weird market in, in that it prices um, the the marginal um, cost. The yeah, we we do think that market design will have to adapt and will have to change. Um, which direction that takes? There's, you know, a bunch of um, kind of things you want to cover, from um, affordability to um, making sure you have uh, the right incentives <clears throat> to um, foster new technologies, um, and making sure that investment happens. But overall, um, yeah, mar market design has to adapt, and, and the way we're doing it at the moment um, is, is not really sustainable. If you look at what what the energy system will look like in the next 15, 20 years. All right, thank you very much. We already reached the end of this webinar. Thank you ever so much, David Hostert, for this very enlightening uh, presentation and your replies to the question of our listeners. Many thanks also to Tim and Audrey from our team for setting up this webinar and for the technical support today.
Now, before we sign off, just a few announcements for your agendas. Uh, coming up next at the Franco-German office before the summer break, we have um, a topic that David mentioned, um, which is um, of growing importance, a debate on just transition, how to share burdens and benefits of the energy transition in cooperation with the French Embassy in Germany and an all-star casting. Make sure to check it out and register, register on our website. And um, while you're there, um, you can also uh, download today's slides. Um, as I said, uh, you will receive uh, within a few days uh, a notification mail um, to tell you once they're ready for you to download. And you can also uh, check out while you're there um, many interesting publications um, that we uh, have been uh, writing uh, and publishing over the past years uh, on many uh, questions uh, that are of uh, great importance to everything concerning energy and climate. So take your time while you're there and take a look around and do your shopping for your summer holidays. And please do make sure that you're on our mailing list to stay updated on our upcoming conferences. Well, that's all for me. That's all from my side for now. Thank you very much for tuning in today and being with us. Please do stay safe. Have a great summer. See you soon. Bye bye.